Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be joined once again by Dr. Kristen R. Godsey, who is an award-winning author, professor, and chair of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She has written 12 books, including Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence, Red Valkyries, Feminist Lessons from Five Revolutionary Women, and Everyday Utopia, What 2,000 Years of Wild Experiments Can Teach Us About the Good Life. She also hosts the podcast AK-47, Selections from the Works of Alexandra Kollontai, which rocks, and which inspired her 2022 book. So I've had the pleasure of sitting down twice before with Kristen, and I will link both of those conversations below for everyone to check out. The first was about love and sex under capitalism versus socialism, and the second was about her book everyday utopia looking at alternative ways of organizing social reproduction and by extension production so Kristen welcome back to the show thank you so much for joining us I'm so excited to talk about international international working women's day with yes, you yeah <laughs> that's right international working women's day that's what it should be called but exactly exactly yeah. yeah so getting right into it I mean uh I mean as we just implied you know in North America I think probably elsewhere also but I'm just based in North America International Women's Day is not called International Working Women's Day, and it has been right. largely distanced from its radical history, uh, largely co-opted by celebrities and brands, and often treated as a day to just celebrate womanhood or celebrate the achievements of women under capitalism. So right. how did this day begin, and what were the demands of the women who were organizing it? Right. So I have, a, I have a big answer to that. But before yeah. I start, I'm just curious, how do you celebrate it in Canada? Like, is uh, there a thing in Canada? There's a march. It's, it's largely there's a like march. A, uh, there's a march. Yeah. yeah a women's march. Um, and it's pretty well attended, I would say. I mean, it definitely was better attended after the 2016 election. And then, yeah. that, you know, kind of spurred <laughs> a lot of people went out for it. But right. I would still say, you know, it's largely it's not a radical event, you know, there's, there's nothing. Um, I mean, there were people there who were trying to, um, you know, reinsert that history and, and, you know, had signs and stuff uh, during the March, but overall it's mostly just a March and that's that. And then we don't, we, we don't really think about it or talk about it until the eighth comes around the next year. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause yeah. like in the States, <laughs> I mean, it's really not a thing and mother's day is way more important. And right. when it has become a thing, I would say like in the last I don't know, maybe eight or nine years, it's just been completely sanitized. Of yes. It's history, which I guess we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But let me start mm -hmm. by actually giving a little bit of background on why March 8th is such a great holiday from the perspective of progressive people. So the interesting thing about March 8th is that technically it started in the United States. It started with the American Socialist Party in 1908. And um, I think they sort of formally decided that it would be a good idea to have a women's day and a special like a holiday marking the really important contributions that working women make to the labor movement in particular in 1909. But it was Clara Zetkin, the sort of German socialist affiliated with the German Social Democratic Party. There was this big conference that happened. It was called the Second International Conference of Socialist Women in Copenhagen in 1910. And it was in 1910 that Clara Zetkin, who was a very prominent German socialist and really very much in charge of sort of the socialist women's movement in Germany, decided that International Women's Day should be like a proper holiday. So Clara Zetkin uh, founded this holiday in March. And mm -hmm. March, for a variety of reasons, I think has been affiliated with women uh, historically. And... During And so there was a really big International Women's Day in Europe in March of 1911. And then International Women's Day sort of continued, but then it became extremely radicalized during World War I, when it was really used as sort of a pacifist holiday. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really important in the kind of current moment that we're living in right now to really remember that. International Women's Day was really an anti-militarist holiday. That's a really, really important point. Anyway, um, the, the founding of this was to celebrate women and working women's contributions to the wider labor movement. Because 
as I'm sure you know, very early on, there were tensions between what were called bourgeois feminists, so women of the kind of top 10,000, that's what Clara Zetkin called them. These days, we call them the 1%, you know, the kind of hashtag girl boss, slaying yeah. the boardroom type women. They're the ones, you know, who were kind of wanting married women's property rights and the right to vote and right to education and enter the professions and so on and so forth. But they weren't really paying attention to the issues of working women. Mm -hmm. And then working women were also being radicalized largely within the labor movement. But the labor movement, broadly speaking, in Europe, the social democratic movement and the socialist movement wasn't really paying attention to women's issues. Mm. And so progressive women were kind of caught in a trap. And people like Clara Zetkin and her colleagues, Alexandra Kollontai and others in Europe said, you know, we're going to lose working women to the bourgeois feminists because they're actually talking about women's issues. Mm. We need to kind of bring women on board. And so this, this holiday, March 8th, was a way of reaching out and making sure that working women had a day where they were celebrated, where their contributions were celebrated within the wider labor movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool. So I guess you started to touch on it there, but you know, how did the demands of the socialist women's movement differ from the bourgeois women's movement? So, you know, as this day kind of progressed and you said it got into some anti-military territory, right? So, so how did these demands uh, progress and how are they different from the bourgeois movement? Yeah, so this is a really important part of feminist history. I think in North America, and I would say in the Anglophone world more broadly, we have a problem in that our feminist history is really only one half of feminist history. It's the mm -hmm. liberal bourgeois half of mm -hmm. feminist history. And, you know, not to say that getting the vote wasn't a good thing or, you know, allowing women access to education in certain professions and so on and so forth and allowing them to have, you know, control over their own property. But just that tells you an interesting thing, which is property, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, these are propertied women, largely upper middle and upper class women, some aristocratic women, who are saying like, hey, this is kind of a problem. If I get married, um, you know, the doctrine of coverture means that all of my property and wealth transfers into the control of my husband. And there were a lot of fairly wealthy women, the daughters often of wealthy men, who were not happy with this situation. And so there was a lot of pressure. And what we call liberal feminism, what the socialists would call bourgeois feminism, was really about a particular world in which women of certain classes would have the same privileges and rights as men. Mm -hmm. So socialist feminism or socialist women's activism, which I think is probably the more appropriate term because a lot of people like Clara Zetkin and Alexander Kolontai hated the word feminism because they associated it with these sort of bourgeois women. But these days, it's easier to just talk about socialist feminism or left feminism or Marxist feminism or even intersectional feminism, I would include in that, you know, wide umbrella. So these are women who really had you know, they, they wouldn't have used this word, but they did, in fact, have an intersectional view of what a woman's movement would be. Mm -hmm. And so they were very much attuned to the fact that women of a certain class, i.e. the working class, had very specific needs because largely of their social care responsibilities, the socially reproductive labor that they performed in the home, that traditional labor movement politics and traditional socialist movement politics didn't really address. Mm -hmm. And that because they were working class women, that the liberal feminist movement didn't address. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that there was a kind of recognition of sort of different ethnicities, I mean, th this was largely happening at this time in Europe. And so there wasn't really a real conversation happening yet about race. But that conversation does happen, especially in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, during the 30s and 40s, when you have a lot of Black American women getting radicalized through the Communist Party of the United States of America and, you know, coming, going to the Soviet Union, visiting socialist countries and sort of getting politicized so that March 8th becomes a really important holiday for them as well. Mm -hmm. So these socialist feminists, you know, they really start out on what we might call a kind of maternalist set of policies. So if you mm -hmm. go back and you look at this platform from 1910 at this Copenhagen conference, they're saying that the state should provide universal free childcare. There mm. should be maternity insurance, basically what we would call parental leave 
that's paid and job protected. Mm -hmm. They're really thinking about how can the state help workers who happen to be women live more fulfilling lives. Mm -hmm. And and for them, this is not about, you know, a small group of elite women getting access to the professions. This is really about working class women being better able to combine what they call their, um, you know, work and family or what we might call socially reproductive and economically productive labor. Mm -hmm. So there's a real difference here. And I think the other thing that's really important that often gets left out of this conversation is that socialist women were also very willing to work with men. Mm. Liberal liberal feminists tended to be somewhat separatist, right? They they tended to see patriarchy as the problem, whereas socialist feminists, not surprisingly, tended to see capitalism as the problem. Mm -hmm. And so because capitalism was a system that was also oppressing working class men, working class women had to work together with men to kind of overturn this system. Mm -hmm. And so if you go, again, you go back to that 1910 document, which is this really important platform that I'll talk about a little bit later because it ends up kind of reverberating throughout the 20th century. This document very clearly says that women's organizations should be a part of the broader socialist and communist party movement, right? Mm -hmm. They should be part and parcel of this broader kind of big tent umbrella organization to really challenge capital. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes, you know, meant that patriarchy didn't go as challenged as it should have been. So this mm -hmm. wasn't a perfect thing, but it was very effective in getting men to pay attention to the special needs of women within the working class movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. I wonder if we can link that document if it's publicly available yes. below. Okay. I think it's like on archive.org or, okay. or it might be on marxist.org. But yes, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. if, if you're interested in the history of socialist feminism, this 1910, it's like the platform of, it was voted upon at that conference of the Second International Congress of Socialist Women. It's mm -hmm. a fantastic window into the issues and the, you know, the kind of topics that were animating socialist feminist mm -hmm. over a hundred and what is it? 114 years ago. Now, right. right. And which should still be animating us because, you know, we don't have, we don't have daycare. We don't have childcare. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, in the United States, we don't have job protected paid maternity leave on the federal oh, level. Yeah, There's yeah. so many things that we don't have. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, so these are here, issues. Yeah. It's kind of shocking that 114 years later, we still have the same problem. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I know. So I'm a new mom and I've been dealing with these issues for the past year and a couple of months. And even here in Canada, we do have, you know, the state provides maternity, but it's just it's just unemployment insurance. So it's 55% of what you were making. And so now we're trying to plan for our second and I'm basically forced to go back and try to take as many contracts as I can so that 55% of that isn't terrible, right. but, but there's no daycare available, right? They do give subsidies for daycare, but there's none available. So the wait list right, are like find three it. years long, right? So we're still dealing with these issues. So this platform is still very relevant today. <laughs> isn't it better in Quebec? I heard that Quebec has Possibly. this really amazing system where they mm. heavily subsidize childcare and they try mm. to make it widely available, but maybe that's, yeah. know, that's just very specific. Specific. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, yes, just very, <laughs> very interesting yeah. and, and still very relevant. Um, I hear you. You know, when yeah. my daughter was young, I mean, my daughter was in full time childcare five days a week mm. for, you know, you know, basically from I think she was 11 months old you know, mm -hmm. until she started kindergarten, which was about, you know, whatever, five and a half. Yeah. And it cost me a small mm -hmm. fortune in yeah. just fees because it yeah. was, first of all, I mean, it, to find it was hard enough, but yeah. the cost, mm -hmm. it was shocking yeah. to, to, to have to pay that much money. And when I mm -hmm. told people how much money I paid in childcare, mm -hmm. they were like, their jaw dropped on the ground. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was just really outrageous. And I think it's only gotten worse. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So we've, we've gone up to about, you know, 1910, 1911. So let's, let's keep going. So how did International Women's Day intersect with the Russian revolution? And I guess maybe you could talk a bit more about the, the anti-military character of the, the demands. Yeah. And this is really important because this is how we get the actual date of March 8th. So if, um, 
it's really important to understand that we in the West are on this thing called the Gregorian calendar, which means that there was this sort of calendrical reform that happened under Pope Gregory. And the calendar that we use is this calendar called the Gregorian calendar. But in Russia, in Tsarist Russia, before the Bolshevik revolution, they were on the Julian calendar. And so on the day of March 8th, on our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, which would have been February on the Julian calendar, there was a huge protest of women. And a lot of these women went out on the streets and they were kind of, there was a revolution sort of brewing in Russia. There was a lot of discomfort and anger and frustration at the situation in World War I. The Tsar was extremely unpopular. You know, um, women were really unhappy with the rations and with the, the disability pensions that their husbands were getting when they came back from the war, like severely disabled and or dead. Like this was a real, there was a real problem in Russia that had everything to do with World War One, mm. And so there was this spontaneous protest on International Women's Day. And these massive numbers of women go out onto the street and start protesting. And it's really important to remember that the men, the, the, the working class men kind of told them not to do it, but they did it anyway because they mm. were very, very frustrated. And once you have this massive people, massive number of people out on the street, the men start joining them. And this protest is what eventually causes the February Revolution, which is the February Revolution is the moment when the Tsar actually is forced to abdicate. And it paves the way for Russia's unilateral withdrawal from World War I. Mm. And so this is a really important part of the history. It's kind of, it's the instigator in some ways of what's called the February Revolution, and the October Revolution, although by our calendar, the October Revolution actually happens in November for the same reason, right? These calendars are about two weeks off. Mm. And so, so, but it had this very strong mil anti-militarist component to it. Mm -hmm. There was this real sense in that uh, women, for whatever set of reasons, I think historically women are associated with peace, right? Women, when women get really... Um, angry about war, they, they take to the streets. And so that mm -hmm. was this sort of instigating moment in um, on March 8th by our calendar in 1917. And then a couple of years later, there's a big international congress that is held in Moscow. And Clara Zetkin is there again. And it is at that congress in Moscow where the international sort of socialist women's movement decides to permanently fix March 8th as International Working Women's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, in honor of the role that women played in basically getting the Tsar to advocate and also eventually paving the way for the withdrawal from World War I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's so amazing. And I think very few people here know about that history. Right, uh, so it's right. very important to talk about. Right. And um, it's also um, one other thing that's really important is that between the February Revolution and the October Revolution, women in um, Russia also get the right to vote. Like they yes. have been politicking and they finally do in fact get the right to vote. So, yes. so there's, so it's not as if they've completely jettisoned what we might think of as the demands of the bourgeois feminists. They want those mm -hmm. two. Right. They want a much more capacious view of the role that the state will play in, you know, supplementing um, the, you know, helping and socializing the work that women have to do in the home. And so mm -hmm. very shortly, like in 1917, after the October Revolution, Alexandra Kollontai, who's this very prominent socialist feminist, she was also in Copenhagen. There's a great picture of her holding hands with Clara Zetkin in Copenhagen. She becomes the Commissar of Social Welfare. Mm -hmm. And she's a very vocal and prominent Bolshevik. She's, you know, one of the people who's there when they make the decision to actually have the October Revolution to overthrow mm -hmm. the provisional government in Russia. And for the for the time that she is in uh, the position of the Commissar of Social Welfare, basically the Minister of Social Welfare, uh, and then eventually she also becomes the head of the women's organization within the Communist Party. Mm 
she puts a lot of these programs that had been laid out in that platform that I talked about in 1910, she actually puts them into practice in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And so mm -hmm. that platform finds its first full realization in the 20s in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so amazing. And for anyone interested in Colin Tai, again, shouting out Kristen's amazing podcast, AK47. Yeah, so interesting. So I'm glad that you brought all of that up because I wanted to next focus on how the gains that Soviet women influenced the gains that we have here, because even the right to vote, I don't think that many people understand that the gains of Soviet women influenced our own right to vote here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I actually have a, a, a whole book on this. It's more of an academic book. It's a history. It's called Second World, Second Sex. And it's mm -hmm. the ways in which our kind of liberal feminist dialogue with socialist feminism really kind of provided a catalyst on both sides. Mm -hmm. But but the key part of the story is that, so for instance, the Soviet Union is the first country in the world to guarantee first trimester abortion for women in 1920. Mm. Um, it's very early. It, it, uh, it gets overturned by Stalin in 1936. And then as soon as Stalin dies, it's reinstated in 1955. Mm -hmm. But the Soviet Union is extremely progressive. They Not only do they create these you know, kindergartens and creches and sort of job protected paid parental leaves. But they also do things like try to socialize some of the care that women do in the home. So they have public cafeterias and canteens, public laundries, mending cooperatives, right? There's this real way in which Colin Tai is trying to understand that the family is this productive unit and that the state should step in and really help free women from the burdens of this labor that they do for free in the home so that they will be more, you know, able to contribute broadly to the society. Mm -hmm. Also, she liberalizes things like divorce, mm -hmm. which was very popular uh, initially in the Soviet Union and, you know, allows women to keep their own surnames and allows, um, you know, uh, looks for ways in which the state can really support, you know, gives, uh, gives support women and families and then gives really juridical equality to women. So all of that is happening in the Soviet Union. And the United States, like, you know, we're really behind the game, right? <laughs> uh, and so a lot of, especially I would say in the 20s um, and 30s, a lot of people who are associated with the women's movement in the United States, a lot of names that we might think of are very sympathetic to socialism or communism or anarchism in the case of people like Emma Goldman, right? Mm -hmm. So they're coming from a left perspective because they see very clearly that the liberation of the working class can't happen without the simultaneous liberation of women. And they argue that the liberation of women also simultaneously can't happen without the liberation of the working class. So these two movements are very much intersected. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you have the growth of the American Socialist Party and of the CPUSA, and you also have a pretty large contingent of Black Americans who get involved in left politics. Some of them go off and they fight in the Spanish Civil War and they come back really radicalized. Mm -hmm. and so civil rights also becomes part of this. Mm -hmm. But the, the moment, I think, that, that is really important is 1957, which is the Soviet launch of Sputnik, mm. which is this little beeping ball that's a satellite around the earth that freaked the Americans <laughs> out, right? I mean, it totally freaked the Americans out because nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to be able to do something that scientifically advanced. Mm -hmm. And so the, and I've, I've written an article about this as well. And, and there's a lot of like panic total panic behind the scenes and American leaders that are mostly white men are like, how did they do this? How mm -hmm. did the Soviet Union beat us, right? The Soviet Union is this poorer country that is supposed to have this inefficient totalitarian, you know, system, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the, one of the reasons is that they have double the brain power, right? Because they are training women. And there's this very important 1957 study. There's this Office of National Manpower Planning, and they do a special report called Woman Power. And in that report, they, they, they realize, much to their dismay, that the Soviet Union is creating tens of thousands of engineers, you know, that are women, as opposed to like 
13 <laughs> that, that we produced in the United wow. States. Wow. So there's a, you know, there's a panic. So in 1958, mm -hmm. the American government passes something called the National Defense Education Act. And that act actually earmarks money for the scientific and technical training of women, as well as minorities in the United States. Like there's a sense that we have to do something to excavate as much latent talent within the population as we can. And then in 1963, Pre President John F. Kennedy creates this thing called the First Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. Mm. And if you look at the preamble, you, we can probably link to this too. It's uh, it's on available online in the JFK Presidential Archive. This um, It's an executive order. And in the preamble to this executive order establishing this commission, President Kennedy suggests that this is being done for national security reasons, right? That women are really important to... <laughs> cause of defeating communism. <laughs> and I think, you know, this also goes back to uh, McCarthyism, like in the late 40s, early 50s, there was this women's organization in the United States called the Congress of American Women, which was explicitly communist. It was an international organization. Again, a lot of black women were involved in this organization. They get called up before the House on American Activities Committee. And as part of those hearings, the white dudes in the American government say that all women's organizations, all calls for women's rights are basically just communist fronts. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in women's rights, it's because you're a communist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, that's the kind of language is Cold War language. Similarly, mm -hmm. if, you're a, if you're a proponent for civil rights, you're also a communist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's awful. So I, can I, I'm going to just take a second and tell you like a little anecdote. I have a colleague, Beverly Gage at Yale, who wrote a really interesting biography of J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. And she told me this really interesting story. When she was going through his archives, J. Edgar Hoover was a real anti-communist mm -hmm. and was, you know, really, really worried about like leftist activism among white Americans in the United States. And he linked that to the civil rights, um, you know, project in the United States. And so one of the ways that they tried to flush out American communists, white communists, was to put them, you know, in a situation where they would be sitting in close proximity to a person with dark skin. And if, if, it was, if that person was a communist, they wouldn't mind. Mm. But if that person wasn't a communist, they would be really uncomfortable. I mean, like that's that's the level wow. of racism, right? That like yeah. infiltrated the American mindset around these issues. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is, is that there was this real linkage between between women's issues and communism early on. But then, mm -hmm. by 1957, because of Sputnik, and by 1963, because of President Kennedy's uh, first Presidential Commission on the Status of Women, there's this sort of realization that look, we really, really, really need women. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to contribute to the fight against communism. But worse is that if we don't do something, if we don't actually start tackling these women's issues, because, you know, so many women had worked during World War II, the Rosie the Riveters of the world, and then mm -hmm. they were pushed back into the home yeah. in the 50s, the Leave it to Beaver years, and they were not happy about it, right? right. So, you know, we tend to think of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique as like, you know, some kind of founding moment in 1963 of the women's movement. But we forget right? That that was also the year that the Soviets put Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of stuff going on within the Cold War that basically kind of the Soviets are saying, we actually care about women's issues and we are actually educating and training our women. And you, like the free countries yeah. of the West, not only are you repressing your you know, racial minorities, but you're also oppressing women. So you're, you're just basically white fascist is basically what this yeah. is saying. Yeah. <laughs> and the government, you know, the government, they kind of freak out about that. Like Mary Dudziak has a wonderful book called Cold War Civil Rights. And she makes a really interesting argument that people within the kind of white male halls of power were very threatened by these Soviet claims that they were not as free and liberal and democratic as they claim to be. Mm -hmm. And I make a very similar claim in terms of women's rights. And so I think that so much of the progress that Western women made mm -hmm. was because of the Soviet Union. And then after World War II, all of the Eastern Bloc countries that also very interestingly implement 
the platform that mm-hmm. was laid down in 1910 at the Second International Women's Congress. Mm-hmm. And then after it's in Eastern Europe, so we're talking, you know, Poland all the way down to Albania here. And then slowly it goes to China and Mongolia mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Cuba and Vietnam and Angola and, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Yemen, places all over the world, Nicaragua, right? there, There's this way in which this socialist platform really throws up a challenge yes. to women's activism. And I think that we in the West do not realize that mm-hmm. so much of the progress that we made was in dialogue and in response to Eastern Bloc agitation around the yes. importance of women's rights. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so incredibly important and a history that needs to be remembered and retold (laughs) constantly for people. Um, I think it would do a lot for, you know, the kind of new McCarthyism that's happening now, right, to understand that, well, hey, actually, there were a lot of great things that were implemented and that still need to be implemented today, right? Like there's so many pieces of that platform, as you said, that we still need to implement right now. Um, And I think there's still a lot of wrapping up as well of women's issues, anti-racist issues and things like that. The people are still calling that communist right right now. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, exactly. It's as if, you know, it's as if they're so uncreative that they can't come up with another term. Right. But right, right. But if you look back, like Claudia Jones, who was a a, a Trinidadian, she was in the United States and she eventually she gets she gets thrown in jail and eventually deported for a speech that she made on International Women's Day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was precisely about the importance of women and the labor movement and this anti-militarism, because she's very anti-militaristic. Right. This is Mm -hmm. this is in the 50s. Right. um, You know, as the the Korean War is is looming on the horizon Mm -hmm. and she eventually ends up Claudia Jones ends up in exile in the UK. But there are some really important, you know, ways in which um, women's rights and civil rights and the sort of broader labor movement and socialist politics intersected in the United States in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And then they are crushed Mm -hmm. by McCarthyism, yes, by the House on American Activities. I mean, it's really, really just an obliteration of those alliances because so many people – you know, they either they either leave the country or they're forced into suicide or they just go completely underground. You know, Betty Friedan herself had a kind of radical left labor history that she did not like to talk about mm-hmm. right before she wrote The Feminine Mystique. Mm-hmm. So even our own history, Kate Wigand has a lovely book called Red Feminism, mm-hmm. which goes back and traces some of the ways in which the very bourgeois liberal feminist movement in the United States had links to socialist and communist women's activism. Right, right, right. And then uh, there's also another book called, I think it's called Sojourning for Freedom by Eric McDuffie. And he looks, I think it's it's a sort of a collective biography of five or six black American women who Mm -hmm. really cut their feminist teeth Mm -hmm. in the CPUSA. So there's a lot of really interesting stories out there that we don't get told, that we never hear. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. Because the fear is so great. I mean, because I mean, to the credit of these, you know, white men in power at the time, you know, they're not wrong. There is, there are connections between women's issues and socialism and communism, right? Um, But it's the framing of that as something to be, you know, absolutely feared and crushed at all costs, which is, you know, Come on. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I do think, yeah, you, you know, it's it's kind of worth stopping for a moment and like emphasizing that, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. white men in power who had every interest, their own self-interest in upholding patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy, the kind of troika of their power, mm-hmm. they were very attuned to potential threats. Yes. And and they still are today, yes. right? I mean, this is <laughs> this is the same sort of troika <laughs> that we're dealing with: patriarchy, white yep. supremacy, and capitalism. And I would ar- I would also argue militarism, which is yes. a sort of you know part of all three of those other things. It yeah. kind of goes hand in hand. And so, mm-hmm. when you think about the fact that women historically, you know, they they do tend to be you know relative to men more apolitical, right? They tend to stay on the sidelines. But when they do get involved in a cause, then 
it's trouble for the people. Yeah, power, <laughs> yeah right? for sure. When, for when sure. you get the when you get the women angry, yeah, um, then really big things start to change. I mean, think about mm -hmm. the Romanov dynasty. You know, lasted centuries until those women went out on the street and were like, "We are not happy about what is going on." And so you, right. my, my my son, are going to abdicate now, right? Right. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter yeah. if you're a Romanov; you are just done. We're doing mm -hmm. something different now, and I think that's yeah. really important to remember. That yeah. historically, it has been in these moments when women really come together and stand up. And, and that's true. I mean, I think also more broadly speaking from kind of anti-militarist politics, some of the most successful movements in the 20th century that were anti-militarist, like Madres de la Playa de, Playa de Plaza de Mayo or Women in Black or Green and Common Women, like these were very successful pacifist movements. I don't know if the pacifism is precisely the right word, but that's mm -hmm. where they kind of get categorized. They mm -hmm. tend to be women movement. I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything essential about women that makes them better no. advocating for pacifism. I just think societies mm -hmm. are more responsive mm -hmm. when it's women. Yes. Especially they're more mothers. Threatened. Yeah. Yes. They're more threatened. Right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So when the Soviet Union fell, I'm assuming that a lot of the gains that were implemented and the, um, uh, the programs from this platform were reversed in Russia and much of the Eastern Bloc or has, you know, anything been retained or has that largely been rolled back? Yeah. So there's actually some really interesting empirical evidence here. I mean, early on in the nineties, there was just like an utter dismantling of the social safety net, broadly speaking. And so, mm -hmm. yes, kindergartens and crushes and a lot of social welfare program programs that had been in place prior, you know, to the collapse of communism, they were dismantled. Um, and that was really hard for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's just like the West, desperately trying to find childcare, trying to find good quality childcare, you know, trying to balance the hours that you have to work with the hours that you have to take care of your kids. Like, you know, how much homework do they have? All the kind of nasty balancing acts that we have to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some, you know, and then capitalism and the particular form of capitalism as it as it was imported to Eastern Europe or imposed on Eastern Europe at that time mm -hmm. was pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it made more sense to, you know, get a breast enlargement than it did to go to university for women because it was mm -hmm. better investment in terms of your prospects of being able to actually pay your rent and eat. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, it was a really un pleasant, I think, time in the 90s in particular. I was, I actually, it was funny, you know, earlier this week, I went into a, a store to get a SIM card and I'm speaking to the woman in Bulgarian and she's like, oh my God, you speak really good Bulgarian. Like, how did you learn Bulgarian? Like most foreigners don't learn Bulgarian. And I said, oh yeah, you know, well, I lived here in the 90s. And she was like, oh wow, I lived here <laughs> yeah. in the 90s. Like that was the mafia time, right? Yeah. So, you know, the 90s are kind of remembered in this really, really kind of weirdly strange and devastating way, depending on who mm -hmm. you talk to. Mm -hmm. But, 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 but despite, so despite the real erosion in a lot of these social safety nets, most East European countries still have mm -hmm. really good parental leave policies. Now they're mm -hmm. very different. Um, they're not as great as they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, Childcare is just as hard to find as it is in the West, I would think. But, you know, because I think of the legacy of socialism, there are far more women in science and technology in Eastern Europe than there are anywhere else in the world. Mm. Um, and when you look at the map, you can very clearly see that it's concentrated in former socialist countries so that even The Economist magazine, which, by the way, is not a bastion of socialism. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right? The Economist yeah. magazine will say, OK, the fact that there are so many women in science and technology is a part of the socialist legacy. They, they admit mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. There was also a paper that came out in 2018 uh, out of Germany. It was called Girls, Math, and Socialism. And they looked at standardized tests, and they found that the, the gender gap in mathematics um, actually is much lower or non-existent in socialist countries compared to capitalist countries. Mm -hmm. So there, there, are, there are these really interesting legacies, mm -hmm. I think, to this day that women are a lot more autonomous and a lot more independent in, in mm -hmm. many ways, mm -hmm. but it's obviously not as good as yeah. it was, you know, in, ter in, in specifically in terms of the social safety net. Right. So yeah. In some ways that's, 
you know, that's, that's sad. Um, yeah. And it would be better, I think, if all, all of us sort of thought about what those policies were able to accomplish, because mm -hmm. not only did they give women more life choices, but I think they were ultimately better mm -hmm. for society, right? I mean, for sure. Yeah, we these societies, you know, they they had lots of negative things about them. I'm not going to like sugarcoat the reality of life in 20th century state socialist countries, but there were these policies and and that were really progressive and we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So you're in Bulgaria right now, you just mentioned. Um so how are you going to be celebrating today? Yeah, so I am going dancing. Nice. <laughs> uh, some of us women are going to go out to dinner, and um, and you know there there are various parties around that are kind of billed as Women's Day parties and like ladies' nights, and so it'll be it'll be you know a, a kind of festive environment. It, we don't in Bulgaria there there isn't you know because of the weird politics of the holiday it is associated with the socialist past mm -hmm. so there isn't anything like a march. Okay. Um, but there is a sort of recognition that you give people flowers and you it, it is the equivalent of like what we might think of as Mother's Day. You pay mm. homage to the women in your life who have helped you in one way or another that you admire and respect. And mm -hmm. and then, you know, a bunch of us are just going to go out and have a really good time. Nice. <laughs> Celebrate, you know. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So I'm really actually looking forward to it. I think it's going to be I'm flying home very, very early tomorrow night. Tomorrow oh, gosh. Morning. So oh, my it's, gosh. It's one of those situations <laughs> where should I come home early and try to sleep a little bit before I get to the plane or should I just stay up? <laughs> I think we both know. Because <laughs> I, I have to be at the airport like 3.30 a.m. So oh, it's gosh. right in the middle. Like, you yeah. know, if I can make it or not, I'm not sure. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see wow. how I feel. <laughs> well, that sounds great. Well, enjoy. Um, and uh, that's all the questions that I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or leave people off with? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there there are some great links on the history here, and yes. it is a really important holiday. And I think we should not forget that it is a holiday that really does see these broader intersections between lots of different kinds of social movements, and that women's movements and women's activism doesn't have to be siloed, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be this kind of separatist thing. It has to be part of a broader progressive movement in order for us to really make the world a better place. And it can be done, right? I mean, I think, you know, the best example is if you were living in Tsarist Russia during World War One in 1917 under the yoke of an unjust Tsar, a dynasty that had lasted for centuries, could you imagine that going out on the street to protest one day would change the history of the country forever? Now, yeah. I know people are going to argue that maybe it wasn't necessarily uh, for the best, but the fact that it changed, I think, has to remind us of the contingency of the present moment that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. The future is ours to make, mm -hmm. right? It is not something that is given. And we live yeah. in a world where people are trying to tell us all the time that there isn't an alternative. There are always alternatives. We just have to stick together mm -hmm. and go out and fight for them. Yeah. Oh, I just got goosebumps thinking about <laughs> going out one day and protesting and then changing the entire world. So the entire yes. world. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. This is such a great conversation. As always, I will link to all of your work below and our previous conversations and just have the, the best time tonight. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Happy International Working Women's Day. Yes. Happy International Working Women's Day to you and to everyone. Thanks everyone Bye. for joining us and we'll see you next time.